Good evening, and welcome to the 27th summer of Chester County's Town Tours and Village Walks. My name is Dan Chahar Krasnoff, and I am Chester County's Heritage Preservation Coordinator, having begun working in this position only a few short weeks ago. Even though tonight's event is not in person, Nancy Shields is still here making sure the program runs smoothly. Nancy, can you say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. I am thrilled to see so many attendees joining us for our third week of town tours and village walks. Thank you for taking this virtual journey with us again this year. I hope you all get to visit the Bernard House in person and take the self-guided trail walk this Saturday and Sunday, July 3rd and 4th during park hours. Enjoy today's presentation. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Nancy. Besides Nancy, I'm grateful to two others without whose efforts this event would not happen. Kathleen Hood coordinated production of tonight's program. Karen Marshall organized this year's town tours and those for the 14 summers before this. The program was initially conceived by Jane Davidson to encourage the county's extensive network of historical commissions and societies to showcase local history. Each summer on Thursday evenings, free walking tours of Chester County's many historic sites and districts were presented by these organizations. Chester County is a very special place. It was founded in 1682 by William Penn and has a long and rich heritage that literally embodies the span of the country's development and history. Our well-preserved cultural landscape has many stories to tell. This year, the town tour focus is journeying to freedom about the slavery abolition movement and the Underground Railroad in Chester County. Tonight, the Pocopson Historical Committee and the Friends of Bernard Station will bring to life the history of the house, the abolitionists Eusebius and Sarah Bernard. The house was in the Bernard family from the early 19th century through the mid 20th century. These determined Quakers risked their own well being to ensure the safe passage of numerous escaped slaves moving from station to station on the Underground Railroad. Besides tonight's virtual program, I encourage you to visit the site and take the self-guided trail walk this weekend, July 3rd and 4th. Begin at the Bernard House on South Fawasset Road, located just north of the Route 52 roundabout, across from the side entrance to the Pocopson home, and utilize the QR codes on site. Kathleen Hood will introduce the program. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm Kathleen Hood of the Chester County Historic Preservation Network, and it's a pleasure to join you this evening. Chester County is a vibrant tapestry woven together artistically by people of many different races, colors, creeds, religions, and national origins. One of the three original counties in Pennsylvania, Chester County has reveled in its history and cultural heritage by sponsoring the annual town tours and village walks program for the past 27 years. Through these programs, we are able to discover our shared past in order to inspire both our present and future. In tonight's program, the third of our 2021 town tours and village walks summer series, Journeying Toward Freedom, the Pocopson Historical Committee and Friends of Bernard Station will present abolitionists and Eusebius and Sarah Bernard House. Throughout our presentation, you may submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then typing in your question. We will answer as many questions as time permits. And now it is our great honor to welcome Don McKay, Chair of the Pocopson Historical Committee and a member of Friends of Bernard Station, as well as Lorraine Lucas, also a member of Friends of Bernard Station, as well as the third great granddaughter of abolitionist Eusebius and Sarah Bernard, whose historic home in Pocopson was a station on the Underground Railroad. Please join us in extending a warm welcome to Lorraine Lucas and Don McKay. Thank you. The theme of this year is Juneteenth celebration and Chester County Town Tour and Village Walks is Journey to Freedom. We are going to provide you with some history, a lot of dates, and share with you stories from four generations of a Quaker family committed to the abolition of slavery and the equality of women, the Bernard family. Through this one family and people they were involved with, we will touch on occurrences in the evolution of the abolitionist movement, 
in Chester County and the surrounding area. In this presentation, we will identify some family members as they relate to Eusebius Bernard, whose house and farm we will be talking about later, and we hope you will visit in the future when it is established as a heritage center. Over 90 years from the Revolutionary War to the ratification of the 13th Amendment, many Bernards in Chester County were involved in anti-slavery societies, committees, and the Underground Railroad, often going up against others with differing perspectives on the topic, even amongst other Quakers and often against the federal government laws. Let's start with the Quaker community, also known as the Religious Society of Friends. Yes, some Quakers owned slaves in the early 1700s. It's worth noting that slaveholders in the Quaker community attended to the spiritual and material needs of those they enslaved. In 1758, Quaker Anthony Benize and John Woolman, believing slavery to be inconsistent with Christianity and common justice, persuaded the Philadelphia Quaker Yearly Meeting to take an official stance on slavery. It was concluded that slave owning was incompatible with membership. So by 1774, if any Quaker continued to own slaves, they were disowned by the Quaker community. This was years before any state took legislative action for the abolishment of slavery. The Quakers didn't stop with their own community. They moved on to raise the moral issue for everyone, both in Britain and North America, active campaigners for complete abolition. And so it was with the Bernards and other abolitionists in Chester County. This is Eusebius's grandfather, Richard Bernard's farm in Newland Township, just below Marlboro Meeting, which by the way, he, along with his neighbor, Isaac Bailey, established in 1801. Obviously this is current day drone footage and we are immensely grateful to acknowledge the Wickersham's who last year in 2020 placed this beautiful historic Chester County farmland in the Pennsylvania's Farmland Preservation Program to maintain, to remain in agricultural production permanently. While living on this farm, Richard Bernard kept a diary. An entry for May, 1779 read, at a conference about slaveholding. And 10 days later, an entry read, committee about slaves. He was a model Quaker and active in Philadelphia yearly meeting. So the timing of this activity corresponds to the strong lobbying efforts by the Quakers for an emancipation law in Pennsylvania, which did occur a year later in 1780. Likely these activities were led by his friend, Anthony Benize. Richard Bernard's name is later seen on a list of members of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, the first anti-slavery society in America which was originally formed by the legendary Quaker abolitionist, Anthony Benize and a few other Quakers and concerned Philadelphians in 1775, days before the fighting began for the Revolutionary War. It was originally called the Society for the Relief for Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage. It reorganized in 1784 with an emphasis on abolition as a goal so it was renamed the Pennsylvania Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery and the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage. In 1787, it reorganized again to broaden its membership and helping to do so by writing the society's new constitution were members Benjamin Franklin and Benjamin Rush. Eventually this organization became known as, and is still today, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. The society worked closely with the Free African Society formed in 1787 in Philadelphia in a wide range of social, political, and educational activity. The Pennsylvania Abolition Society organized local efforts to support the crusade to ban the international slave trade and had Benjamin Franklin bring the matter of slavery to the United States Constitutional Convention of 1787 held in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, this did not make it into the US Constitution. In 1790, under its president, Benjamin Franklin, the society went to the first Congress, then meeting in New York City, a petition asking for the abolition of slavery and an end to the slave trade. It sparked heated debate in both the House and the Senate 
resulting in a select committee claiming that the Constitution restrains Congress from prohibiting the importation or emancipation of slaves until 1808. And so they tabled the petition. Pennsylvania Abolition Society inspired the establishment of anti-slavery organizations in other cities across America, and it acquired a nationwide reputation for its work. Richard Bernard is listed as a member of this society and worked with these important people. Other generations of Bernards and abolitionists from Chester County became involved with the society over the years. The organization has carried on and it remains today as the Pennsylvania Abolition Society dedicated to providing educational and informational services. As the American Revolution began establishing the United States, the Northern states began to abolish slavery. Beginning with the 1777 Constitution of Vermont, which actually was before it even became a part of the United States in 1791. Followed by Pennsylvania's 1780 Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery. The goal of the Pennsylvania Act was to remove as much as possible the sorrows of those who have lived in undeserved bondage. Notice the word gradual. It appeased slaveholders to keep the enslaved individuals they already owned unless they failed to register them annually. It did, however, prohibit further importation of enslaved people, and it provided for eventual freedom of individuals born of an enslaved mother. Quaker lobbying had much to do with getting this legislation, and Richard Bernard was part of that, as noted in his diary. In 1788, in collaboration with the Society of Friends, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society successfully petitioned the Pennsylvania legislature to amend this Abolition Act and to prohibit the transportation of enslaved children or pregnant women out of Pennsylvania, as well as the building, outfitting, or sending of slave ships from Philadelphia. The amended act imposed heavier fines for slave kidnapping and made it illegal to separate enslaved families by more than 10 miles. Statistics report by 1820, the statewide population was 30,202 African-Americans with 211 of those classified as enslaved. That same year in Chester County alone, 2,734 were classified as free colored persons and only seven classified as slaves. In the 1830s, numerous new anti-slavery societies arose and Chester County abolitionists participated. The American Anti-Slavery Society was formed in 1833 in Philadelphia by William Lloyd Garrison of Boston, who is the editor of the most widely circulated anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. It later headquartered in New York City. Local abolitionist Bartholomew Fussell was one of the original signers of the American Anti-Slavery Society's Declaration of Sentiments. By 1840, the society had over 2,000 local chapters and around 200,000 members. Its plan was to reach mass audiences through lecturing agents, petition drives, and a wide variety of printed material. William Lloyd Garrison frequently visited the Kennett area and developed close ties with the Chester County abolitionists, including the Bernards. Many of the lecturers for the organization, including Frederick Douglass, were speakers at Longwood Progressive Meeting House. The Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society formed in 1838 in Philadelphia, not to be confused with the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. Founders included James Mott, Lucretia Mott, and Robert Purvis, who also had close ties with the abolitionists in the Kennett area. William Still was a clerk for the society in 1847, and later he was chairman of its Vigilance Committee. In 1838, the Kennett Anti-Slavery Society declared that anyone who aids in the restoration of a fugitive to his master is guilty of a crime against humanity and religion, and any minister of the gospel who attempted to justify slavery was to be regarded as an enemy to religion. Needless to say, there was quite a bit of activism for anti-slavery in Chester County and surrounding areas. But slavery was still legal at the federal level 
and the United States Congress had formulated the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which required the return of runaway enslaved people. But many enslavers did not think it was strong enough of an act because the states and residents did not have to offer aid in the hunting or recapture of runaway enslaved people. So at the insistence of the Southern slave states, the Fugitive Slave Act was strengthened with the Compromise of 1850, which required even the governments and residents of free states to enforce the capture and return of runaway enslaved people. This put fugitive slaves at a risk for recapture all of their lives. It also classified children born to enslaved mothers as enslaved and the property of the mother's enslaver for all of their lives. The Compromise of 1850 outraged Northern public opinion. Abolitionists nicknamed this the Bloodhound Law. However, increased risk and penalty did not deter the Bernard's participation on the Underground Railroad. In October 1851, the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society met at Horticultural Hall in Westchester and passed resolutions pledging the assembled not to obey the Compromise of 1850. Local Quaker meetings were often divided on how to respond to slavery and meeting houses frequently became foreign forums for anti-slavery and temperance speakers. This caused growing aggravation and criticism among the members. While Quakers believed slavery to be morally wrong, many of them weren't willing to break the law by aiding freedom seekers. Things came to a head in 1852 with the Marlboro meeting riot. Here's what occurred. In June 1852, Pennsylvania's first women's rights convention was held at Horticultural Hall in Westchester. Today, this is a part of the Chester County History Center. The early women's rights movement and the anti-slavery movement were closely connected. So most of the participants at the convention were also anti-slavery activists. At the conclusion of the convention, it was overheard that abolitionist Oliver Johnson intended to speak at Marlboro Friends meeting on first day, June 6th. Many Quaker meeting members disapproved of religious meetings for worship being used as a platform for social issues. So the local constable was asked to attend that Sunday. As anticipated, Oliver rose to speak and was politely asked to sit down. When Oliver rose again and persisted to speak, the constable was asked to remove him. But with that, it was met with protest from Eusebius Bernard and some others. So those who were upset that their meeting for worship had been interrupted left the meeting and those remaining listened to Oliver Johnson present his talk on anti-slavery. This incident is described as a Quaker riot. However, the situation wasn't over. The next day, Oliver Johnson and four others were arrested and charged with disrupting a meeting. Johnson needed to return to Philadelphia, so he paid his $5 fine with an additional 50 cents for court costs and left to write up the affair in the Pennsylvania Freeman newspaper. The others, Eusebius Bernard, his brother William, his nephew Vincent, and Dr. Bartholomew Fussell were tried the following Sunday and convicted of disturbing the peace of a religious gathering. They declared that they would not pay the fine and that they were unjustly persecuted. While Dr. Fussell was speaking, a constable entered the courtroom and announced that the fines and fees had been paid, perhaps by the prosecuting party. This encounter further escalated and the following year in May, 1853, 58 women and men temporarily left their original meetings Many read out, were disowned, and not accepted back until many years after the Civil War ended. They created the Pennsylvania Yearly Meeting of Progressive Friends based on moral accountability and practical righteousness. They built and dedicated the Longwood Progressive Meeting House in 1855, just in time for the third annual session of the Pennsylvania Yearly Meeting of Progressive Friends. It was opened for religious, moral, scientific, and literary purposes and activities. It always had a Quaker core, but it invited membership to all interested in supporting various reform topics. Founding members included Eusebius, his brother William, and their cousin Simon Bernard, 
All three were prominent station masters and conductors on the Underground Railroad. This meeting house is located across from the entrance gate to Longwood Gardens. Today, it's the Brandywine Valley Tourism Center. This 1847 map lets you see where several of the places we've mentioned are in relation to each other and to Delaware. Hammerton, where Old Kennett Meeting is located, was a heavy location for Underground Railroad activity and meetings. Three miles from the Delaware's border and around 11 miles from Wilmington, Delaware, where Thomas Garrett operated from. Hammerton to Longwood Progressive is close, just around a mile up the road and three miles surrounding Longwood Progressive in different directions gets you to Marlboro Meeting and the Eusebius and Sarah Bernard House. Notice Bacoxon Township is not identified on this 1847 map. The following year in 1848, Eusebius Bernard and 27 other male residents from four townships signed a petition to form Bacoxon Township from joining parts of Pensbury, East Marlboro, and West Bradford townships. Named Pocopson for the stream that flows through it, a derivative of an Indian word meaning roaring waters. Which brings us to Bernard Station, home of Eusebius and Sarah Bernard, Bernard a documented underground railroad station. Three miles from Longwood Progressive Meeting House, a journey they often took for activities at the Meeting House or activity on the Underground Railroad. It's located in Pocopson Township, a short distance above Route 52 Roundabout on South Wawasset Road, across from the side entrance to Chester County's Pocopson home. So next time you're traveling the Route 52 Roundabout, look to its northwest corner or traveling west from the roundabout down Lenape Unionville Road, look immediately to your right for the beautiful 60 plus acres of farmed land and the Bernard House. When at the house, take in the engaging vista looking south where less than six miles is the Delaware border, a state where slavery was legal and gazing to the southwest in the distance is the Mason-Dixon line. Picture yourself there pick, uh, preparing for the arrival of freedom seekers, relieved to reach your safe haven and be given clothes, food, and a place to rest. Eusebius was the youngest of four sons living into adulthood of Richard and Sarah Bernard. He was raised near Marlboro Village with many of his Bernard family members in the immediate area owning farms from the vast amount of land ownership his grandfather had accumulated. Family friend Gilbert Cope, author of the history of Chester County, described Eusebius as a man of great force of character who strove for an end to intolerance. Eusebius married Sarah Painter in 1829. Sarah Painter was the daughter of Enos and Hannah Painter and grew up on the early homestead of her mother's Minshaw family near the village of Providence, now in Delaware County, which was also involved in the Underground Railroad. Sarah's brothers had planted over a thousand specimens of trees and shrubs and today this is Tyler Arboretum, which was named as such because their nephew, John Tyler, had inherited the homestead. It's interesting to note that Sarah's brother, Minchal Painter, gave the name Media to the nearby town in 1849. Sarah's father had purchased the Bernard Station property years before and gave it to her sometime after she married Eusebius in 1829. Sarah's father set it up so that when Sarah's sons became a proper age, they would inherit the farm. We suspect one reason it was not put in Eusebius's name was because of his prominent participation in anti-slavery activities and concerned that the farm could be placed in jeopardy. Eusebius and Sarah had eight children with five living into adulthood, three daughters and two sons. When freedom seekers arrived at the Bernard house, they were given food, clothing, and rest before moving on to the next safe house, often at two o'clock in the morning. When women and children, they may have slept on mattresses on the warm kitchen floor and men in the barn. The Bernard children often helped. They also did their share of transporting freedom seekers if Eusebius was traveling for religious visits. One of the youngest conductors on the Underground Railroad was their youngest son, Enos, who when just old enough to ride a horse, led a group of 17 men on foot to his uncle William Bernard's house near Marlboro. At times, if the coast was clear, the freedom seekers were hired for work on the farm. Pocopson had a large free African-American community 
which likely helped in concealing the freedom seekers. However, even free African Americans weren't always safe from possible kidnapping by slave hunters. Sadly, Sarah Painter Bernard died at age 44, leaving five children, the youngest five years old. Five years after his first wife's death, Eusebius married Sarah Marsh, who was from another strong abolition family involved in the Underground Railroad. So together they continued aiding freedom seekers. We are going to play a recording by Bob Seeley, Friends of Bernard Station's history advisor, to tell of the adventure of Harriet Shepherd. Please understand this is not an actual letter, but the content tells the story. This adventure and the photo you see is included in William Still Book of Underground Railroad Records. Wilmington, third month, 15th day of 1856. My dear friend, Eusebius Bernard, I received your letter concerning Harriet Shepard and her children. I am glad they respond within the fair circle of friends, and, and after they spent the night with you, I'm glad your son. Took them in the wagon to our friend Lewis Kemperton. I understand our friend Lewis sent them to our friend William Still in Philadelphia, who recorded their information and sent them further north to freedom. When Harriet and her five children escaped in November from Chestertown, Maryland, they took four heads of horse, two carriages, with a few men to help. She could not bear the thought of having her children wear the miserable yoke of slavery. Since the children were young and unable to walk that distance, and she was penniless, she needed the help and transportation to escape. When they arrived in Wilmington by daylight, a friend of mine spotted them and directed them to me. I felt I needed to get to families along with as soon as possible, as I felt the master might be following them. So I gave them food, a change of clothes, money, and a carriage with fresh horses. I left the master's carriages and horses tied to a hedge in town. I was told the master did find his horses and carriages, and he began looking for the 11th that escape. My friend, God is watching over us. We are listening to that inner light that has guided us for many years. Thy friend, Thomas Garrett. We have tracked Harriet and her group to New York and continue to explore her reaching Canada by researching with someone in Canada who could be the great granddaughter of Harriet's youngest son, John Henry. Harriet Shepard's leadership places her in the small category with Harriet Tubman of women leading a group to freedom. Longwood Progressive Meeting House was a beacon of reform, anti-slavery, women's rights, capital punishment, prison reform, to name a few. As I mentioned earlier, while it always had a Quaker core, they invited membership to all interested in supporting the various reform topics. Speakers included Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Susan B. Anthony, William Lloyd Garrison, and Lucretia Mott, to name a few. Several became close friends of the Bernards and often stayed at their houses, particularly that of Simon Bernard in Newland Township. Harriet Tubman also came to the Kennett area on occasion and in her famed 1854 Christmas escape, she led three of her brothers to freedom and a stop over the Delaware border into the state of Pennsylvania at the Pensbury home of Longwood Progressive members, Allen and Maria Agnew. Longwood Cemetery was established across the road around the same time as the meeting house, 1855. It is the resting place for many of the abolitionists involved with the Longwood Progressive Meeting, and it was set up by declaring that there will be no unchristian distinction on account of color or condition. Eusebius Bernard and many of his family are buried here. His first wife, Sarah, had passed away in 1849 and buried at Marlborough Burial Grounds. 
but she was later moved and placed at Longwood Cemetery next to her husband Eusebius and daughter Elizabeth, who had sadly died at age 26. I'm going to play another recording by Bob Seeley to tell of a meeting with President Lincoln. Again, this is not an actual letter, but the content tells the story. September 29th, 1862. Dear Eusebius, I read in the papers this morning that President Abraham Lincoln's cabinet met on September 22nd to refine a draft on the Emancipation Proclamation, which he started shortly after our meeting. Looks like our delegation of William Bernard, Liza Agnew, Oliver Johnson, Dinah Mendenhall, Alice Hamilton, and I had a great influence on President Abraham Lincoln as he acted right away without delay. Now we wait while our nation is engaged in a great civil war, a war that we know is about slavery. I feel a military victory would help the cause. I look forward to the day when all men are created equal. I look forward when the fight has ended. I look forward to the day when President Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. Your friend and the light. The Emancipation Proclamation took effect January 1st, 1863. William Lloyd Garrison hailed this proclamation as a great historic event, sublime in its magnitude, momentous and beneficent in its far reaching consequences. Eusebius's brother William was in the group meeting with Lincoln. Likely neither of them knew they were actually Quaker cousins, third cousins once removed to be exact. Abraham Lincoln's great third great grandparents were Richard and Francis Bernard, Quaker who arrived in America from Wiltshire, England in 1682 and Sutter in Chester County, Pennsylvania. The Bernards of Chester County are Abraham Lincoln's Quaker roots. December 1865, the United States adopted the 13th Amendment to the Constitution which abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. Years of effort and conviction from abolitionists like many in the Bernard family, including their cousin Abe in Washington, DC, were of significant contribution during this historic period. We have the opportunity to preserve and share this history involving Chester County by establishing Bernard Station Heritage Center. So we're going to go from the past into the present and kind of give a short synopsis of the property as it was and how it has changed over the decades and centuries. Um, so we'll start with the property that was purchased by Enos Painter, the father of Sarah Painter Bernard in 1827. The house was enlarged sometime after the time of Eusebius and Sarah's marriage in 1829. Enos Painter retained ownership, but allowed Eusebius and Sarah use of the property throughout the rest of his lifetime. The house would have had a simple wood shingled gable roof through the mid 19th century. The rear L was originally a single story and used as a workshop for the farm. In the 1880s, the house was Victorianized by the descendants of the Bernard family, a single story wraparound porch with wrought iron posts, a conservatory, and a front gable with twin arch top windows were added in this period. The second story to the rear L was constructed also during this period. Upon the passing of Enos Painter in 1857, he passed down the farm to his grandsons, Eusebius Bernard Jr. and his younger brother, Enos Bernard. As the boys were still too young to take over the property, it was still managed by Eusebius Bernard and his second wife, Sarah Marsh Bernard. When Enos Bernard wed Abigail Steele in 1868, the farm was subdivided into two parcels. Enos Bernard would own the property east of the public road, while Eusebius Bernard Jr. 
would own the property to the west of the public road, including, including the stone farmhouse. Each brother would make changes to the structures on their parcels to adapt to changes in agriculture, as well as raising their families. The Enos Bernard property was owned by his heirs until around 1950, when it was sold to Chester County, and the Bacobson home was constructed on part of the property. The Eusebius Bernard Jr. property was owned by his heirs until 1944, when it was sold to Dr. Frederick Dersheimer. Dr. Dersheimer was not an active farmer, but he was involved with Luke and Steel and the DuPont Company. And um, he was a, a doctor that dealt with, um, with patients that had trouble after World War II. Chester County was interested in acquiring additional property to raise animals and crops to support the residents of the Cops and Home. In 1957, Dr. Dersheimer sold the farm west of the public road to Chester County. At that time, there was a dairy barn, a tobacco drying barn, the residents, and several small outbuildings. Chester County made a few changes to the property to serve their needs. The former dairy barn was demolished and the tobacco drying barn was adapted to store crops and, and farm machinery. The residence was converted into a duplex to serve as two families working for Chester County. In 2008, Chester County transferred ownership of the property west of the public road over to Pocopson Township. In the arrangement, a new public park with walking trails would be created among the 60 plus acres of conserved agricultural land. The historic Bernard House would be the centerpiece of the area surrounding the new trailhead. As a matter of interest, descendants of Eusebius and Sarah Painter Bernard still lease the farmland nearby the Bernard House. The fourth and fifth generations of the family are well known locally for their farm fresh milk products produced at Bailey's Dairy of Pocopson Meadow Farm, located about a half mile west on Union Valenity Road. In 2019, the 130 year old long neglected tobacco barn unfortunately was dismantled due to safety concerns. Parts of the structure were saved and to be used in, as design elements within the new Pocopson Township Municipal Building that will be constructed on the site starting in July, 2021. The new building will be in the character of a Chester County Bank barn and will complement the style of the Bernard House. Pocopson Township has made repairs to the building, including the creation of a public restroom, updated central heating and electrical systems, and structural repairs to the first floor. In 2020, the original exterior windows and doors were restored in the stone section of the house using a grant awarded by the state of Pennsylvania. The township has plans to continue the restoration of the exterior of the rear L building in the upcoming years. In June of 2021, an agreement was reached between Pocopson Township and Friends of Bernard Station for the use of the first floor of the historic Bernard House to create a new heritage center. Descendants of the Bernard family started working on the initiative in 2018, envisioning a place to tell the story of the use of the property and its importance to the historical events of the mid 19th century. Friends of Bernard Station, a 501c3 nonprofit, is forming plans to restore the interior of the first floor of the house. Much of the original detailing still survives throughout the building, but is in need of restoration. Friends of Menard Station is actively looking for help in the restoration project. Anyone willing to make a financial contribution can send checks payable to Friends of Bernard Station to PO Box 63, Pocopson, PA 19366. For others who would be interested in helping with the volunteer work in the restoration project, please contact us at bernardstation at gmail.com. On Saturday, July 3rd and Sunday, July 4th, from dawn until dusk, a self-guided tour will be set up around the exterior of the Bernard House. It will use a quick response or QR code format where signs consisting of a code can be scanned via a smartphone app to take the tourists to historic information about various topics related to Bernard Station. Free QR code readers can be downloaded in the app on smartphones. To locate the property via street address, 
15 South Wawasset Road, Westchester, will take you to the vicinity of the Bernard House driveway. There is a public parking lot to the rear of the building. At this point, I would like to um, invite Bob Seely, Friends of Bernard Station's Historic Advisor, and Richard Chalfont, Vice President of Friends of Bernard Station, and the second great-grandson of Eusebius and Sarah Bernard to join us for a question and answer. Thank you, Don. Uh, my name is Suzanne Amrich, and I am on the uh, Chester County Historic Preservation Network. I will be conducting the question and answer segment. If once again, you have any questions, please type your uh, questions in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen, and I'd be happy to ask them. Okay, getting started. Many Quakers were thrown out of their meetings for the Underground Railroad activity. Was Thomas Garrett? Thomas Garrett? Uh, no, Thomas was not thrown out of the meeting. Uh, he was he belonged to the Wilmington Friends meeting, and of course he belonged to Longwood, one of the founding members of Longwood. But his wife Rachel was uh, not for her belief in harboring slaves, but because of her attendance. So Thomas and Rachel, uh, it's actually Rachel Mendenhall, his second wife, uh, were very active at Longwood as well as Wilmington Friends meeting. Okay, uh, why were three women and three men from Longwood Progressive chosen to meet with President Lincoln? Oh, very good question. <laughs> um, Long, uh, Longwood believed in equality for all people. Uh, and, you know, to send six men down to meet with President Lincoln wouldn't really follow their belief. So that's why I believe, and my family believes, that uh, three women and three men were sent down to meet with uh, President Lincoln. Uh, was the free black population in the area around Bernard Station any, or I'm sorry, what was the free black population in the area around the Bernard Station in 1850? So according to the census records of 1850, the, the Pocopson Township um, um, population was around um, 500 or so. Um, about 25% of the population at that point in time were free African Americans. Um, the area just to the north of Bernard Station, there were several um, residents or tenant houses that were supporting the farms nearby. There were some properties within Denton Hollow. There were also some properties nearby the Pocopson Creek Valley down from Denton Hollow that were the, uh, the home sites of some of the African-American families within Pocopson Township in that period. Great. Uh, what was the penalty if they were caught helping the freedom seekers? They could be charged with a $1,000 fine, which would be equivalent to about $31,000 today and maybe up to six months imprisonment. But it's also interesting to note that if officers captured um, the fugitive slaves, they were entitled to a, a bonus or a promotion. Huh, that's very interesting. Uh, I have a question coming in. Uh, is Mr. Bailey a Bernard relative? Yes, he is. Actually, his first name is Eusebius. It's Eusebius <laughs> Bernard Bailey. So yes, he is also a second great grandson of Eusebius and Sarah Bernard. Very cool. Okay, so this is a two part question. How long did they conduct an underground railroad station at the house? And where did they hide the freedom seekers in the house or on the property? Richard, would you like to answer that? Um, well, probably started uh, it's hard, it's hard to be absolute 100% because they did not keep records because they were afraid of records being found and held against them in court of law. But basically from the time they probably moved in around the beginning of uh, 1830s to 1860 or so, 
uh, when uh, just before the Civil War. And <clears throat> where do they hide them? Was that the question? Um, yes. They were hidden everywhere. They were hidden in the basement. There was there's also a uh, um, an ice house in the basement, which is where they hid them. They were hid hidden in the forest. They were hidden across the, the, the road in the, uh, uh, there was a tenant house over there. They were hidden in, in the, uh, the grove across in the, in the uh, valley across on the other side of the farm. They basically hid them wherever they could, in the barn as well. And they, but you know, it's, they also stayed, they were invited to sleep in the building, on the floors, in the attic and so on. Um, so it depends where, um, <clears throat> how dangerous it was at the time. And uh, if there was, uh, I, I would, they would have stayed in the main part of the house if it was not too dangerous. Otherwise there were secret places to hide them. Cool. Uh, Carrie Brooks writes, uh, she didn't hear, but how many acres is the property today? Today it's 60 plus acres. Great. Uh, Charles asked, what relation is Eusebius Bernard to Richard Bernard, the first? The very, the very first, the one who arrived in England? Uh, he put Bernard number one, so <laughs> I'm going to assume yes. <laughs> well, we'll go down the list. So Eusebius' uh, second great-grandfather was the Bernard who arrived on William Penn's ship in 1682. And then his son Richard, and then another, and then his son Richard, and then his son Richard, and then Eusebius. <laughs> Follow the line down. Uh, what happened to the Longwood Progressive? Wait, what happened to the Longwood Progressive meeting? Is what Amy asks. Actually, the Longwood Progressive meeting continued until well, 1930, 1940, and then it ended. But that was DuPont then purchased the building. So Pierre DuPont, since then, it's been a brownie troop and some other functions. And then, of course, today, Brandywine Valley Tourism. Great. Uh, does the structure standing today and the property around it look exactly like it used to as the station on the Underground Railroad? So I'll take that one. Um... The house itself, so Bernard, the Bernard house itself looks more Victorianized, I'll call it, um, which was common in the time. So when, when Eusebius Jr. married his wife, also Downing, um, she wanted to modernize the house. So she, she wanted to add some of the features that were kind of common details of that era. So they added the, the, uh, the gable in the front, which was the peak that you see off the front of the building. That was not original to the original house. They added a one-story wraparound porch. Um, it had the wrought iron detailing of the day that no longer survives. And the, um, there was a, a conservatory, believe it or not, on the southern end of the building that was added after the fact. That no, no longer at, is there as well. And originally the one-story L in the back would have been what that would have looked like during the Underground Railroad era. There was a dairy barn behind the building. Originally that is no longer there. The foundation still can be seen. And Eusebius Jr. added the tobacco drying shed in the 1880s to support an advancement or a change in the family's agricultural processes. He, he introduced tobacco into the mix instead of potatoes and hay and oats and more typical things. But the house originally, when it was part of the Underground Railroad, would have had a simple gable roof, more traditional of what you'd see in Quaker farmhouses. It would have had probably wood shingles, and it would have been more of a simple Quaker, a Quaker, Quaker building. All right, I have a bunch of questions about the actual arrival of the freedom seekers and things like that. So one question is uh, how long the journey was it from the Pennsylvania Delaware border to the Bernard station? I've actually calculated this. <laughs> it's six miles, which would have been about a two hour walk. Now keep in mind, they would have stopped at probably the Mendenhall someplace else for safety before continuing up. But uh, it's about 35 minutes with a horse trotting or about um, an hour and a half 
if it was a horse-drawn wagon. Okay. And then uh, how did they know, um, Brian is asking, how did they know that the freedom seekers were on their way? Uh, what was the communication network? There were various communication networks. William Still or uh, Thomas Garrett may also get communication to them receiving in, um, a lot of it was done by families. So for instance, William Garrett was the nephew, I mean, sorry, Thomas Garrett was the nephew of Philip Price in Westchester. So family members, they would just through themselves communicate it or the freedom seekers could just show up. Okay. They would be given a certain direction and they would wrap on the outside in the middle of the night and uh, they would be given some shelter. Great. Uh, how many freedom seekers were likely to arrive at one time? Do you know? I love, most of them, I think, were small groups, but we've seen as many as 17 in a group. And I've heard talk of some other ones that were even larger. Quite often, once they would arrive, quite often it would be decided that they would be split up from then on to go to different locations so that they could be safer. That makes sense. Uh, so Sally Warren's asking, was Hannah E. Bernard a relative of Sarah's? Hannah E. Bernard? Yes. Okay, I don't know about the middle initial E, but okay. Hannah um, was a daughter of Sarah's. Actually, she's my great, my second great grandmother. So oh. she was one of the three daughters of Sarah, if that's the same Hannah that she's referring to. Maybe she'll write in that. Uh, we've got, um, were there any incidents of slave trade, slave trade trackers looking for freedom seekers at the Bernard property? And how was it handled by the Bernard family? I'm not aware of any. Richard, do you have any comment for that? Hmm. It's a hard one to say. Again, they didn't record things because they were afraid it would be held against them in court. I would, uh, from what I understand, the highways were, uh, there were quite a number of slave catchers out there. So there was always a chance of someone seeing something or someone informing. You had to worry about your neighbors informing on you as well. Um, so there is no actual documentation about them coming to the house and trying to get in the house, but they were out there. It was, they were like ghosts. They were out there always. You had to be very careful. You couldn't talk about it. It was uh, something kept within the family or close friends, members of uh, Longwood and so on. So, so Sally, thank you. Uh, so Sally wrote back and she said that Hannah E. Bernard owned a home in the borough of Kennett Square that she owned and she, um, she bought uh, 217 South Broad Street right after Samuel Martin built it in 1880. Not familiar with that. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, do you have any stories handed down uh, that tell how um, stations might have uh, dissuaded uh, those who were in pursuit of freedom seekers? I don't have any specific ways of them intentionally avoiding them. We have some close call stories that we know that occurred at the Cox House, which is near Longwood Progressive. Uh, and the story is that um, they quickly got the group onto the next station. And shortly after that, carriages arrived at the house. They could hear them coming up from Delaware. Um, so I can hear the close calls. And then, of course, their worry as they take them to the next station that they're not being caught along the wall, along the road, and the family members being concerned for the return of the family members safely. So we hear about that more than specific incidences of their encountering any of them. Okay, um, I've got a couple questions that relate to sort of the location of the Bernard House. Where exactly is the Bernard House located? On the Route 52 roundabout that's right there in front of a Copson home, mm -hmm. you would take the South Wawasset exit off of that circle and it's just a short distance up on the left-hand side. 
you can see it from the circle as you're going around. So uh, as you gaze up north, but it's right across from the side entrance to the Copson home. Okay. And then Barbara asks, kind of related, what was the pathway from Delaware to Chester County where the slaves traveled and where did the slaves go after they stayed in Kennet? Paths varied. They varied quite a bit. Um, the most frequent one from Thomas Garrett would come up between what's today Route 52 and Route 100. It would come up that paths and the closest stations there was the Agnew Farm that I mentioned Harriet Tubman had stopped at with her brother. That's a Long Creek Road just on the other side of the border. And then the Mendenhalls were closer to what's 52. They would cross the fields across the Mendenhalls and the Mendenhalls would shelter them and uh, before they got up to Hammerton. Once they got up to any of these places, they could have been dispersed anywhere to Downingtown, um, Vickers, um, who's a potter, over to his area, uh, north to Phoenixville or down to um, Philadelphia. They all varied, the paths varied quite a bit and it all depended on word of mouth, how they got them to the next station. Okay. Uh are any of, uh, of original Richard's buildings still standing? And if so, where? Richard's. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. If they're referring to his grandfather, Richard Bernard, in that slide that we showed of what's now the Wickersham Farm, the original home that was existing in the late 1700s, early 1800s is still the Wickersham Farm. Okay, uh, yeah, I don't, it doesn't really say here, it just says that. The uh, original immigrant's home is gone, I think. The okay. original Richard who came over from England, I don't, his place no longer exists. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, how can I find, oh, oh sorry, it switched. Um, how can I find out if the old stone house I grew up near the the whip on eight four the whip tavern I assume on eight forty one was part of the underground railroad? I would suggest inquiring with Kennedy Underground Railroad Center. Perhaps they maybe have some information. I don't know if they've done research out that far. Mary Dugan years ago has been a wealth of information of items in the uh, Kennett area. That okay. would be my suggestion. Okay, uh, where, um, oh, were the children at the stations involved in helping freedom seekers? Yes. We know that they were at the Bernard house as their youngest son, Enos, um, because nobody was home except himself and his sisters when those 17 men arrived. So he did lead them to his uncle's house. Okay. Uh, I visited the pro Deborah writes, I visited the property and there were double doors at the top of the L edition. Uh, what was there originally uh, where the doors are? I wonder if runaway slaves might have sometimes been hidden in that edition. Richard, do you want to, I know it had to do with the tobacco industry, but Richard, do you know? No, I think they hid them wherever they could. I think it was, just, it, all, it was a matter of timing. The, I don't think any, I, the house is not um, intentionally divided between, uh, air, you know, slave, hiding slaves and, and not the family. I think they were, they were, uh, they were in the house with the family. So I, the, the two doors, they don't signify where slaves would go and where, just the, the knowledge of when that when the addition was built on the L. The L was a one-story building during the Underground Railroad era. It was that was documented. The detailing of the second floor pretty much mimics the detailing of the old tobacco barn that was just removed. But um, the thoughts were just from the architects that have looked at it and made documentation. The double doors used to lead from a staircase to the second floor. It's thought that is where maybe they did some packaging um, work for the tobacco, making it um, packed to market. And they may have had some other storage uses for the farm there, but the second floor of the L was not part of the house when the Underground Railroad was active. 
couple more questions and then we'll wrap things up. Um, how accurate is the recent movie about Harry and Harriet Tubman, Charles asks? Well, uh, Kate Larson, um, I, I will actually, Bob, correct me. What is her name, Kate Larson? Uh, Kate Clifford Larson. Kate Larson. She was the advisor um, to that movie, and she is a Harriet Tubman um, historian, knows quite a bit about it, and has written books. So it is obviously Hollywoodized, <laughs> but she made it as true to the history as possible. Great. To get the idea across, but... Gotcha. Um, Sarah also asks, was Hannah E. Bernard married to Richard W. Bernard living in Kennett Square Borough in 1882? Have no idea. Uh, Richard is a popular Bernard name. Uh, as I said, Eusebius is down from four Richards, you know, and uh, Richard's sons, Richards, and their other sons named their sons Richard. So, um, sorry, I don't, I don't know that one specifically. Okay. Uh, Vincent asks, were the escape tunnels in the basement or the tenant house down the lane? In the basement of the house. Yeah. No, well, I wouldn't quite call it a tunnel, although we have to do some research there. For, be interesting to find one if we could, but there is an ice, um, it, it's a big cylindrical stone uh, um, uh, ice house, ice storage area in the basement. And uh, that is a place where they were hidden. Okay. Usually it was filled with ice and covered with hay and so on. Wouldn't have been too comfortable, but it was there in case of an emergency, which we know it was used, so there probably were some emergencies along the line. Okay. Uh, do you have an estimate of how many freedom seekers pass through the Bernard House or a typical station or even the frequency? Would groups come through weekly, monthly? No, not really. We know that Thomas Garrett and Bartholomew Fussell in particular, we've heard numbers like over 2,000 people that they had helped. Um, the only number I've seen in regards to uh, Eusebius Bernard, again, never knowing you know, an accurate number, but I'd heard over 200. But nobody kept record, so it's really not known. And the time of year, uh, a lot of it was done more, like Harriet Tubman often did it in the late fall, winter time, but it, it, uh, it varied. It varied and it could go a long time without anybody uh, coming across their doorsteps. Okay. Uh, can I interject something there? Mm -hmm. uh, I, we know Thomas Garrett uh, in his letters uh, to William Still and also to Sarah Bradford, uh, the, he claims to help over 2,700 people to freedom. Many of them uh, went into uh, the Longwood area. He would send them up to Longwood area. So uh, there is some record uh, of some of the homes and, 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 and when Thomas would send them up into uh, Chester County, a lot of times he sent a letter with them or a person with them and, and in order to introduce them up in Longwood. Uh, it's really who you can trust. And uh, we had a network of uh, people that Thomas knew in Chester County and also Delaware County. So it's really who you could trust on the Underground Railroad. Okay, we have gotten a lot of really great questions. Uh, I'm gonna read just a couple more and then we'll end things. Um, so uh, somebody asks, how are the Bernard, oh, how are the Bernard Orchard folks related to Eusebius? Yes, okay. Uh -huh. They are, oh gosh, I should pull it up. I've calculated this for them as well. So Eusebius's grandfather, um, as I said, his son Richard is who Eusebius descends from. Um, it's their other son, Joseph, who Bernard Orchard descends from. So they still are related to the, the early Richard Bernard that I talked about in the presentation. So that, was, that would have been their fifth 
fourth or fifth great grandfather, but they are related. They are Bernard connected in this okay. one. Great. Uh, is Richard Chalfont related to the Chalfont family that owned the Grand Queen Anne home in Kennett Square that is now <laughs> the home of Jane Bear's Century 21 real estate practice? Yes. <laughs> We're getting a little bit off. <laughs> By the way, I want to back up a second. Um, okay. I just want you to know that the orchards, have <clears throat> that land, that, that the orchards have been in the family since about 1724 to six. Wow. So, so we're, we're closing in on 300 years of that farm's been owned and operated by, that, uh, by one family, Bernard family. That's impressive. Uh, Barbara writes, I'm so thankful that the Bernard house has been saved and now will be a heritage center. I believe the Cox House has been mothballed. Are there any plans to restore the Cox House? I'll talk. The last update I have on the um, Cox House is not yet, but it is owned by Longwood Gardens. And the mothballing is a historical way to preserve it. And that was done years ago. So they're very attentive to the history of the house, um, but I don't know of any current plans. Well, that'll do it for the uh, question and answers. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's Chester County Town Tours and Village Walks program, Abolitionist and the Eusebius and Sarah Bernard House. Our special thanks to our presenters, Lorraine Lucas, Don McKay, Richard Chalfont, Bob Seeley, the Pacopson Histor Historical Committee, Friends of Bernard Station, Chester County Heritage Coordinator, Dan Shakar Prasnoff, the Chester County Planning Commission, the Chester County Historic Preservation Network, and all of you for making this program possible. Please mark your calendars for the next virtual program in our Town Tours and Village Walk Summer Session, our series scheduled on July, Thursday, July 15th, live at five, when the East Nottingham Historical Commission presents the program, Parker Sisters Kidnapping and Rescue with Roberta McManus. Thanks again for tuning in this evening. Have a fabulous summer and we hope to see you again for more 2021 Town Tours and Village Walks programs. Good night.